Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the difference between observational and experimental studies. We're continuing our unit on economic sanctions, and what we're going to learn today is that there is a significant barrier to inference in trying to understand how effective economic sanctions are at doing their job in coercing other states. Let's step away from international relations for a moment and think about how scientific inquiry is often conducted in other fields. Imagine that there is a virus out there, perhaps with a corona, and you as a scientist are interested in understanding what would stop the spread of this virus. How do you go about doing that? Specifically, how do you use empirical data to verify whether something is or is not effective at stopping the virus. Well, in the medical sciences, there's a clear-cut way of doing this. To begin, you recruit a large number of individuals to participate in your study. You then separate them into two groups. And critically, the way that you separate them is random. Conditional on participating in a study, you are equally likely to be in the left group as you are to be in the right group. It's as if we're taking every individual upon entry into the system, flipping a coin, and on heads putting them in one side and on tails putting them on the other side. There is nothing that we can do to distinguish between the left and the right groups because they are random. Once we've established these two groups that are in expectation identical, we assign one of them the treatment and one of them the control. Here, this would be a vaccine for one group and no vaccine for the other group. We would then wait a while. If the theory that underlies the vaccine is right, we might expect to see something like this over time, where we lose a lot more of the individuals from the unvaccinated group than we do in the vaccinated group. Attributing causation under these circumstances is relatively straightforward. Remember, in expectation, the vaccinated group is statistically identical to the group that did not receive the vaccine. As a result, we can only explain the discrepancy here in two ways. One is that the vaccine is in fact effective at stopping death and disease, and two is random statistical chance. When the medical community conducts these types of studies, they tend to recruit a large enough number of individuals that it is statistically extremely implausible that such a discrepancy would be caused by random luck. As a consequence, we are relatively certain that the vaccine is effective if we observe data like this. Let's compare this to what we observe with economic sanctions. If we wanted to know how effective economic sanctions were at any given outcome variable, there's a straightforward way to figure that out. We might take a group of countries and flip a coin for each of them. And on heads, we give them economic sanctions, and on tails, we don't give them economic sanctions. We would then, after some time, compare the outcomes for those countries that received economic sanctions to those countries that did not receive economic sanctions. Say, perhaps, growth in GDP. And if we see that countries that had economic sanctions imposed on them have lower growth rates in GDP than the countries that did not receive the economic sanctions, then we would conclude with relative confidence that economic sanctions are effective at shutting down an economy. However, that's not the data that we get on economic sanctions in practice. For one, such an experiment would be incredibly morally dubious. For another, it's just impractical. Economic sanctions are expensive to impose, so there's no country out there that would be willing to fund such a study. What that means for us as analysts is that we can't just look at the data on economic sanctions and compare the situations where sanctions were imposed to cases where sanctions were not imposed. We have to think much more about what the data generating process looks like to be able to reach reasonable conclusions about the data that we have. Let me give you an example of how things might go wrong. Imagine that the observational data that we have on economic sanctions looks like this. In other words, the countries here that are receiving economic sanctions 
are not getting them randomly as they would be under an experiment. Instead, it is their natural outlook and the strategic situation that they're in that is causing them to either receive or not receive economic sanctions. Imagine that we made a simple comparison between countries that receive sanctions and countries that did not. Well, whatever the effect that we would observe there would be very difficult to disentangle from the effect of just being a country in North Africa. That's because, for the data I have made up here, countries that are in North Africa are getting sanctioned a lot more often than countries that are not in North Africa. In a situation like this, where the confounder is obvious, it's straightforward to fix the problem. In our statistical studies of economic sanctions, we would just control for that confounding variable. In other words, we would have a control for being in North Africa so we can better isolate the effects of economic sanctions. Unfortunately, it's often not so easy to identify confounders in observational statistical studies. In fact, economic sanctions has a particular problem that is not going to be as transparently obvious and will not have as straightforward of a solution. And we'll see that in the next lecture. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.